do. Anything that you get uh, on your plate tends to cause you uh, fear, uh, worry, or anxiety. Okay, cool. So that's, that's like almost everybody in here. Um, so I'm going to talk about busyness for a second here. So busyness is defined as the state or condition of having too much to do. Uh, I think that is very common for many, many college students, which is why I really want to give this message. Uh, because this is something that if you're not struggling with right now, you're about to be because if you weren't anxious or busy before this, just a heads up in about two or three weeks, we're taking finals, so you're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anxiety often comes from us being busy because we accept a lot of things on our plate and then we go ahead and have to try to you know, figure it out in our head and go ahead and do it. Um, anxiety, if you don't know what that means, which I would be very surprised if you didn't, the definition technically is the feeling of worry, nervousness, unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. So if you know me, you know I love to give stories about myself. Uh, not because I like to get up here and brag, but because I, I'm also very afraid of having an ego from telling my stories. However, I like to view people's stories as not their own because especially when you have God as your author. So God, I believe, has written many stories in my life that I've gone through so that other people can read them and learn from them. Or in my case, I read them for you and you can hear them. Um, and there's plenty of stories that within the last four or five years that I have had the opportunity to go through. And <clears throat> for that reason, I think the stresses and the anxieties and the things in my life have brought me to this moment for a reason and for a purpose. And I believe that's to hopefully like help you guys with this thing you consider or call anxiety. Um, some of these things that I struggle with every single day, at least as of this year, would be uh, failing in my relationships to friends and family, not following God's plan for me in my future, caring about what I look like too much, making the wrong decisions when I know they're the wrong ones, uh, caring about how others view me too much, uh, paying for college, uh, what else did I write? Oh, uh, my future career versus what my current job is in my classes, am I going to be making it the right way? So those are just a few things. And then I just want to like go ahead and point out that like anxiety is really not a joke. And uh, Matt, did you say ulcer? So I got an ulcer from anxiety before. If you guys don't remember that thing, he said ulcer, I think it was. That's not how you explain it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but an ulcer can do to you, especially when you're like in like middle school or something like that. Uh, and like you, you just don't, you can't get food down and it's extremely painful. And for like two weeks, just because I was anxious, there's no real reason. Um, Another thing that some of you might also experience when it's coming to these four weeks for uh, exams coming up is like facing that very real anxiety that you don't know how to deal with, you don't know how to get over. And in my past, I never learned how to get over that. And I end up just like shutting down, overstressing, being over anxious. And then like, <laughs> in my case, I just end up like throwing up and then going to bed because I can't handle it. So. <laughs> I laugh because I'm very scared this is going to happen. <laughs> my goal is, like, mostly speaking to myself here because I'm directly struggling with this anxiety thing, and I know that many people are here too. So, let me ask you a question Have you ever heard God tell you to do something, and then you blatantly ignore it and do something else? You don't have to raise your hand for that one because I know many people do that. And then. My biggest thing is like when you do that, and you're over here, and you're like, God, I know you want me to do this, and you're like, but this is my way, and I want to do it this way. And you ask yourself, why? You go through the whole situation, you realize all the crap that it caused, and you get over here, and you're like, why did I do that? Why did I go ahead and just ignore exactly what I asked God to give me, which was an answer? He gave me my answer. I asked myself, why, when I'm done, because I just straight up ignored it. <clears throat> and then you go ahead and be like, God, you're, so you're on your own path now, because you've ignored what God already told you to do. Now you're over here in this anxious state and you're like, God, just take my, take my anxiety, take the situation, take it into your hands, if it's your will, let it be. When you already ignored what he told you to do. That's a pretty big thing, at least in my life, in the last couple of months, I did that quite a bit. Um, and I found out in like the last, in the last week, I think I've had probably like three-ish panic attacks because I've been, you know, going through like my own anxieties which is really, really weird because that stuff wasn't really a big deal until I decided that I was going to be speaking on anxiety, which is exactly how I've been attacked over the last couple of weeks. So like when I tell you I'm preaching this to you guys and to me, I'm trying to know if you're preaching to me because I've been struggling a lot. But I'll come back to like where that story and where the panic attack came from in a little bit. <clears throat> but I will assume that you guys have all been in very similar situations where you've struggled with a lot of anxiety. Uh, I mean, I know many of you have been at least 
mostly through college, if not you've at least been through a good part of your first year. And there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress even before college too, like in high school and stuff. You go through a lot of situations, and you know, I probably came in here with baggage that I don't even have to probably remind you of because it never leaves your brain. There's plenty of things that I walked in here with that even since I started sitting down here trying to play euchre over there, like there's still things that just run through your head every single minute. So I don't really have to go through and ask you guys what you're thinking of because I know that you're all probably thinking of something that gives you anxiety and it never leaves your head. So like, what do we actually do about it? How do, you, how do you get rid of anxiety? Because like you said, this is a big problem, you don't struggle with it. I'd say 80 to 90% of the students, if I remember my research, but 80 to 90% of all college students struggle with the one big thing, or the biggest thing they struggle with is anxiety. Why? Because we don't know how to actually put the jobs. But upon researching this more, I also saw it, I was watching a sermon on it, because uh, like I said, I've been struggling with this myself, so I've been trying to. Know, be proactive about this and something a pastor said actually made me laugh and it's probably not as funny as it, as it, as I think it is but like he said cellulite or fat if you don't know what cellulite is cellulite and stress have one thing in common you can't not change your lifestyle and just ask for it to leave you can't just pray for it away just like so like cellulite so fat like all that all that stuff so like <laughs> that stuff you can't just ask for it to go away you can't just be like hey um you just leave now like that'd be super great and like, not at least with the lifestyle that you're currently living that had developed that cellulite, you can't be being sedentary and asking to change your lifestyle and just asking for the, like, the, the benefit of changing your life, the benefit of actually putting in the work without actually doing that, you know? So then I'm like, so well, well, if you can't do that with cellulite, you have to go and like, you know, go to the gym, watch your diet, count your calories, whatever you want to do to get rid of it, you have to put in some effort. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> not ready for that one. Um, but God says, um, I'm going to go to Philippians 4, 6 and 9, or 6 through 9, if you guys have your, your Bibles or if you want to turn those open. If not, I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then it closes with, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. It's like, so that was four verses and there was a lot there. There was a lot. And I've been reading this for the last two weeks now, probably every single day. And now I have to analyze it and look into it so that I can hopefully break it down for you guys. But let me say, like, my, my analysis is perfect. I've not gone to any, like, school for this. I've not gone through training. I just listen to me and me talking to God and my analysis of this. But the first thing I think is blatantly obvious here that I can't just, like, make up is uh, it starts with saying just stop stressing. Don't be anxious about anything. The next thing it says is pray and thank God for everything instead. So that job, the money that you don't have, the relationship that you're trying to start or the one that's trying to end, the grades that you want, the amount of likes that you get on a post, or the fear of missing out, which would cause you to put yourself in bad opportunities. Thank God that you have the opportunity to even be here. So like that test, thank God that you have the opportunity to be here taking that test. Mm -hmm. Thank God you have the opportunity to be on this campus in this room right now. Thank God you have an opportunity to be in a relationship with someone who wants to be in a relationship with you. Or thank God that God's giving you a new season of life. There's so many things. Because Thanksgiving is actually, it's, it's really weird because I don't have anything about this right now, but Thanksgiving is coming up. So like the root word of Thanksgiving, at least in biblical terms, is giving thanks to God for the opportunity instead of looking at the bad and the opportunity. Because when you when you thank God for it, like when you when you change your mind instead of being like, oh, this is not what's stressing me out, but when you thank God for the opportunity, your entire mindset changes. Like, there's no way you can be focused on the bad if you're like, God, thank you for this opportunity that's causing me to stress out. Or, uh, you can't be thankful and hate it at the same time. Like, it's not possible. So your mindset actually changes when you do this, and it's not an if, it's a when. He says, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, offer your quest to God. And the God of peace will come 
to guard your heart and your mind. So it's not an if and maybe. So sorry, John, if you take this away, um, and then you might help. No, it's if you are truly there and thanking God and asking for Him to come and take over your situation with prayer and petition. Petition is just asking God, and with thanksgiving, the God of peace will come and cover you. And it's going to transcend all of your understanding. So that's what it says. What's the actual verse there? It says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will come over you. So, if that doesn't make sense, like, it's not supposed to. It surpasses understanding. It surpasses understanding. So, like, if you're wondering what that kind of peace is like, it, you, can't ex you can't explain it until you've actually surrendered it fully to God and asked him to come take over. Then you're going to understand it, because it's not going to, we can't picture it until it happens. And then you're going to understand it, and you'll be like, or you're going to experience it and be like, wow, that doesn't make sense. How did that just work? Like, so you're telling me if, like, I do what the Bible says, then it's actually going to work, right? Interesting. I don't know. Something that I just turned around in my head. Uh, and the next thing it says, right after all that, so once you once you request God to, you know, about whatever opportunity you're in, whether that's a stress, one that's causing you stress, one that's causing you a lot of joy, you, you approach him with thanksgiving and you ask him, um, and he helps change your mindset. So now after you've done that, and you've talked to God, and your mindset's been changed, now what? Well, it says go ahead and start thinking about the true, the noble, the right, the pure, the lovely, and the excellent, and the admirable. Why? It's because if you're going to pray for God to change your mindset, you can't go back to looking at the stressful things. You can't be like, God, this sucks over here, and I hate this, and it's giving me anxiety, and I'm worried about it all the time. And it's like, God, can you please take this away? and then immediately walk back to it. Because then you're not really giving it to God. You're just being like, hey God, this is my situation. Look at it, it's horrible. I did it to myself. Can you please take it? God's like, yeah, I can totally do that. Can you like change your mindset? No, I keep it. I want it. I want that still. I want to keep living with that baggage, which is not, it's exactly what we don't want to do. So try to change your mindset. Really give it to God. So then I, I come to think about this because I was as as I was analyzing this, I was like, so I feel like I've done this before. I feel like I've, I've, I'm was clearly still struggling with anxiety, so what am I doing wrong? Because I'm still stressing about the stupid things in life that I put myself into, right? The opportunities that I, like, those exams coming up, I'm already stressing about that. Heck, in the past, I stressed about exams that I know I'm already gonna pass and that I'm already four point in the class, like, why am I stressing? I know the material. Why? Because I'm choosing to be stressful in this opportunity instead of thanking God for the opportunity to be taking that class and getting that A and getting that knowledge to be the career that I want to be in, the one he's called me to. But what happens when you're like, I ask him, I ask him to guide me, I ask him to give, me, give him, or ask him to give me his opinion and what he wants me to do and to guide me in my life, like, what happens when I don't hear that, when I don't feel it? I believe that comes down to the question of balance. So like, who or what do you spend your time with? For example, this thing, phones, like this. I know I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this thing, on, on a minimum, I'm gonna go really low on this guess on how long we spend on our phones. Because if you have an iPhone, you can see the screen time and you can track your time and it gets really depressing when you realize it's gone up every single week and you're trying to fix that, but you can't. So minimum, I'll say three hours. Three hours a day minimum. I feel like that's a really low estimate for college students or anybody who's on a phone. How long did you ask God to take away that anxiety? 30 seconds? Three minutes max? Yeah. That's gonna have a, a way bigger impact on your life right now. I mean, our, our minds aren't supposed to sit here and take every single vacation, relationship, anniversary, newsfeed, latest video, funny joke, Funniest meme, whatever. Every single day, you literally have a ball and chain sitting in your pocket the entirety of your day, keeping you chained to whatever you're trying to get away from, because those are the opportunities that you're missing to spend time with some God. Mm. You know? Come on. I mean, <laughs> we devote so much time to the things and the small things in our lives that don't really matter. We devote, we devote so many time or so much time thinking about the things that God has already figured out for us. But if he's trying to tell us our answer, and we're filling our mind with this, where is it? we're not going to hear it. We're not going to leave any room to hear his answer because this is all we're focusing on. 
This is just an example. There's plenty of other things. Who do you hang out with? Scientifically, you become most like the four or five friends that you're hanging out most with. I'll tell you, for me, at least in these most recent months of my life, the four friends I have to hang out the most with is Noah, Koo, Josh, and Brandon, three of which are in this room right now. And if you haven't seen us all together, I mean, we're like one cohesive unit. We don't even have to say half the things that we do or half the things that we say. We don't even have to like, I'll tell you just an example. I have never once seen a Beyblade in my life. <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna give this example, but I'm giving it. Um, <laughs> So, so, this is Josh, he's one of my best friends up here. Uh, <laughs> about a week or two ago, like, we decided we were going to go to Josh's house. It was the first time all four of us went to Josh's house. I've never once played with a Beyblade. I never once really saw them. I saw the sick commercials where this kid was like, Little Rip. was like, that's sick. And then, so, so what did we go with Josh for two hours at Josh's house? We played Beyblades for two hours. And it was great. And I loved it. But would I have ever even picked up one of those? Not the way my life was before I met Josh. That's <laughs> 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 not meant to call out Josh. Like, hey, I'll say one more thing. Like, me and Noah and Josh. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say that. Let's just say a party. There's so many stupid things. All right, but. Now imagine if like you have one of those four or five friends, which I'm sure you guys have at least three of them, or those those few influential people in your life. But imagine if that first one was God, like Jesus. Like so much can just be affected. Like you've seen your your friend groups change over the years. You've seen how you've changed over the years because of the friends you hang out with. Now imagine, now imagine if we hung out with Jesus as much as we hung out with our friends. Because if you start talking and acting and looking and treating others the way that your friends treat others and talk and act. Now imagine if you started doing that very same thing with the other person you're hanging out with, which is Jesus. It's, it's kind of crazy to me that, like, that's exactly what the Bible tells us to do, to live a life like Christ. But why aren't we spending time with Christ when we really want him to take control of our lives and we want to look more and act more and talk more and treat others more like him? We just don't actually do it. It's like, what the heck? I mean, we only, we only ever ask, but we never listen for the answer. I mean, like... <laughs> For example, I found myself doing this this week. I was super anxious. This phone was in my pocket, right? This is just an example for my life. Everyone knows their own things. But I, I sat down and I was like shaking because I'm like anxious about the stupidest thing. And I'm sitting there praying. And I'm just like, God, like, can you take this from me? Can you please like, just take this away from me? And like, I'm giving you control of this. And like, what do you want me to do in this situation? I said amen, pulled out my phone, checked to see if I missed any texts. Missed any updates. I'm not listening for the answer. If you simply go from one thing to the other, sometimes you gotta ask, you gotta listen, and then you gotta be still and hear for that response because God's already given us responses. Heck, like I said, half the time he gives us the answer before we even make the decision and we know what the answer is, but then we choose to do it our way, right? I had one in my life. I also heard another thing uh, which kind of hit home. It was a couple weeks ago I did my church. Uh, they said whatever you're most anxious for or whatever you're most afraid for in your future is of where you trust God the least in your life. Because if you think like if you think about it, he's grabbed a whole of these hands and he can, he's made us, <laughs> wrote our stories, he did everything. Why are you anxious about the future? You know how many times your week has changed this week? Has anyone had to change of plans? I've I have plenty of changes to plan this week. What makes us think that we can plan out a week? Heck, what makes us think we can plan out a freaking future if we can't even like trust God to listen to his answers and then go ahead and follow through with them? That's just not how we do things. It's not gonna work. Sorry. <laughs> Over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about who Jesus is, right? We looked at him as Jesus is God, Jesus is human, uh, or Jesus is man, and then Jesus is suffering, what he did for us and what he died for us for so that he can get this relationship with us that we're not understood. It doesn't make sense, right? Like this guy who's so good, so pure, so perfect, died for us to get a relationship with us, and then we don't actually get the time back, right? We don't spend that, we don't get that relationship back. And that's all we want. I mean, he's the, he's the rock that we stand on, but like, what does it matter what you're standing on if you're just gonna fall and get tripped and because you don't know how to balance anything and then your life starts tumbling down around you? Does that sound familiar? Because I'm sure as heck does for me. Every single time, go ahead and like, God, just take this. 
figure this out in my life, but then I don't balance well on God and on the rock that I'm supposed to be standing on, the one I come up here and say, hey guys, I'm standing on God, this is how I'm balancing my life. But if I'm not really balanced, if someone something comes and knocks me over, I'm just falling. And then everything's coming down with me. I think that's a perfect cause for anxiety. I mean, heck, if you're trying to balance all of the things that you guys do on the rock that's perfect and the rock that's sound, but if you're standing on one leg balancing everything, you're not going to last long. So what do we do about that? So like, how do we actually get past this anxiety? We've been talking for, I don't know how long now, but we haven't even covered like, what do we actually do to get rid of it? I think I might have mentioned it a couple times, but I have one word for that, surrender. Simply surrender. The technical definition of surrender is to abandon oneself entirely to a powerful emotion or influence. Now while that's a really good definition, I think there's something different when it comes to spiritual surrender. And it's really cool because I'll just scroll down the Google page and then there's spiritual surrender there. So I clicked on it and, and it said, I thought this was very interesting actually, surrender means to feel, not just in your head, but in your whole body. And allow that feeling to express itself through you. When you surrender, you live, and when you don't, you stiffen up. When I read that, the only thing I heard was when you surrender, you can breathe, you have peace, you have hope, you have joy. When you don't, that anxiety, those opportunities that you're choosing to live in, strangle you. Spiritual surrender is surrendering to life as it is because we believe in the God who made it exactly how it is. So there's your freedom. Surrender your circumstances, your feelings, your emotions, half of them that you put yourself into, and that God's already trying to solve, heck, God's already solved, surrender to him. I mean, look at the end of Philippians 4, 8, 9 again. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. God of peace will be with you. Like we surrender it, right? So we truly actually surrender it now. So we actually learn how to surrender, right? We can sit there and be like, all right, God, I'm finally giving this to you. Now, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but then after you actually surrender that, after you actually give it to God and thank God for the opportunity and ask him to take actual control of it this time, then you change your mindset, you start thinking of the good things. And this thing I skipped over the first probably five times I've read it, but then it talks about like a past tense thing. It says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. So if you're asking for an answer and you hear an answer or you see an answer, do the answer. <laughs> Why? Because the God of peace will be with you. And that's what we want. We Good. don't want the anxiety, we want the peace. Amen. Amen. It's not an Amen. Do it, and this will happen. So, like, why do we not do it? It's right there. So tonight, uh, we're actually going to put this into practice because it's the first time I think we've ever done something like this in my life, at least to my memory. But we're going to try and actually surrender our crap to God. We're going to give Him our anxieties because I'm done failing to this anxiety. I'm done falling to it. I'm done being controlled by the crap in my life that I put myself into. Those lies, the pasts, the, the old truths, the new truths, the anxieties, the pain, the unknown. I'm done trying to drive my own car down the road that I wasn't supposed to be on. I'm actually going to finally like surrender this. So I'm not talking like the hands off the wheel, but then you're driving with your knee. No, I'm talking hands off the wheel, front buckle, passenger seat, God gets in the driver's seat. Give him the car, because it's not even your road, it's not your car, it's his story, it's his life. It's... So what areas are you holding back from God? What are you not telling him? What are you still trying to control? There's a song that's been flying through my head these last couple of weeks, and uh, two people in this room have heard me listen to it so much, and that's uh, Morgan and Mackenzie up here, and the two of my residents, and they hang out way too often. Um, <laughs> and the chorus, so like the chorus of this, of this, of this song, if you've heard Waymaker before, is one, super good. The bridge is what got me. Um, this chorus it talks in it and it says, or chorus line, and it says, You are the way maker, the promise keeper, the miracle worker, and you are the light and the darkness. 
he has it inside that in order. I know I'm sorry. I haven't messed it up yet, and I just did. But like you're light in the darkness. That was one of the biggest things. Because like I don't know about you, but when when, when your face and your, your your life and everything is just crowded with anxiety, it's hard to see God in that. It's very dark. It's a lonely place, especially when you're trying to control yourself. So there is a light in the darkness. The bridge is the thing that like transformed my entire life. When I heard that, this was actually a couple weeks ago, 1829, me and Noah were in the back, we were jamming to the song. I was on a little jam, I remember they jumping, like rocking hard to a song that's not a rock song. Like it was great. And we, we thought we were in a mosh pit. Like that's how hard we were going to the song. But the, the line that got me the most and like actually just like hit me and I stopped for a second was, even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. Because we don't always see them, we don't always feel them. Like I said, it's easy to get tangled in the anxieties of life, especially when you realize you did it yourself and you know the answer, but you're not gonna do it. You, it's hard to find God in that, especially when you feel like you're away from him. I'll be honest, these last two months of school, two, three months now, time's flying, like, I have not been in a very great place with God. It's only been these last couple of weeks where I finally like heard this song. It snapped me awake because I realized how how far I've gone. I've made bad decisions and I purposely knew what God's plan was. And I, I asked him, and I, this is the weird part. I, I asked him, I listened for the answer. I heard the answer and I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. He's like, here's your destination. That's where I want you. But I'm like, God, there's a shortcut right here. Let me just figure out that one over. I don't need your GPS. I don't want to go back there. God has a plan for your life. He's got that road. I'm driving my own car over here now. I'm like, where am I? Like, where am I going? Why do I feel so wrong? Why do I feel so off? It's because God's right over my shoulder. He's like, hey, it's just, let me drive. Let me drive. Come on. Move. I'm like, no, no, this is mine. And I'm telling you, last time I gave a sermon to Young Minds, it was like the first weekend or the first Friday that we met. And we're back in uh, Hillcrest. So if any of you were there, I'm glad you had to experience Hillcrest, but I'm happy that like you weren't here because this is kind of a pain in the ass. But over there, like, I'm going to be honest, I, was, I didn't want to be standing up there. I didn't really feel God. I didn't know anything that what I was talking about. I wasn't passionate behind those words. And I think if you see me, saw me speaking in uh, Hillcrest versus now, I think you got some, maybe some uh, vision on that because I was not passionate at all over there. Like the God of my life was not speaking through me. And that's all I want him to do to me. I just speak through me and change someone's life. That's all I want. Over there, it was just like, oh, this is another thing. I'm going to sign up for this here, another thing on my plate. I'm going to fulfill. And now I'm walking down this road that I want to be walking. And, yeah. What I'm trying to get through to this is that the moment that I woke up was when Morgan and Mackenzie accepted Christ in their life. And maybe if you want to talk about this. <laughs> saying that was me at all that was not me that was all god i'm never going to take credit for that because one first off who are we to take credit it's his story second off it's god i mean <laughs> so like what in your life are you holding on to like I, I want you guys to really think about this because like you wanted that freedom from the anxiety if you're not experiencing anxiety you can will that's a fact of life you're going to experience it Anxiety sucks. Like, do you want to get away from that? Or do you want to keep driving down your own path in a car that isn't yours on a route that you're not supposed to be driving on because God's up there? He's like, hey, just, just let me let me turn. I know the way. And you're like, yeah, I know you know the way, but like, I know my way. And maybe you aren't even in the car. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God. I'm not here to say, like, I'm trying to force this down your throat head by any standard. I'm not here to change any of your guys' lives. I'm going to let God do that. But if you feel an urge to do that, and you have an urge to talk to somebody and question about that, and you want this God to take away your anxiety, you want to feel that peace, 
you want to get in this car, because I can promise you that's the ride that's never like, there's no ride like the ride that you're on in the ambition. I'm gonna be honest. You have highs and you have lows, but you have a God that's with you through it all. You're gonna go through the same crap anyway, but you have someone who's behind you. It's like, hey, I got you. You'll have that rock to stand on. And once you learn how to balance it, you have a God of peace that's with you always. I don't know a better way for that. But if you want to talk to any one of us, if you want to come talk to me after the sermon, because that's you, like, please do. But I think Matt's going to start passing out some papers right now. And they're just simple lines.